High pressure steam locomotives. Witness the power! So much pressure. Uh, but, but why, though? I mean, I think most of us probably understand that, you know, steam engines use pressure. That's, like, why the steam works. It, it expands, and the, the cylinders move, and the train goes choo-choo. I mean, that's... I, I, it's a fairly well understood concept, I would say, at least among rail fans, but high pressure steam locomotives are a bit of a weird case, and also get pretty weird in general, to be honest. And for this video, I thought about going through a whole list of, you know, just different high pressure designs, but I, I'm only going to focus on really one, because frankly, most of them all have the same problem, and the one, I think, is good enough to illustrate the issue with high pressure, but what is a high pressure steam locomotive? What separates that from a regular one? And even to answer that question is actually kind of annoying, because historically the definition of a high pressure steam locomotive has varied depending on the time frame we're talking about. In the early days, the pressure that steam engines used wasn't very high at all. But over time, as things got more refined, the pressure did increase. And in the modern day, for our purposes, it is generally understood that any steam engine that is operating above 350 PSI is considered a high-pressure steam locomotive. And the reason for this definition is mostly because above 350 is when things start getting really wonky. Because engineering a machine to withstand pressures above that becomes way more complicated and annoying. After all, you don't want the thing exploding. For obvious reasons. But I suppose this brings up the question, um, okay, that's great and all. Uh, why are we doing that at all? Like, why, why make a high pressure steam locomotive? What's the benefit here? Well, in order to explain that, I have to get into a little bit of physics. So I'm going to try to dumb it down for you as best I can. For full context, understand that a heat engine, which... See, I've already lost you guys. Okay. A heat engine is just any kind of engine that transfers thermal energy to do mechanical or electrical work. That's it. That's all a heat engine is. Naturally, a lot of different kinds of engines can be underneath that umbrella, and a steam engine is one of them. A steam engine is a kind of heat engine. And maximizing the efficiency of any kind of heat engine depends upon getting the temperature at which the heat is accepted into the engine, and in this context it'd be raising the steam pressure, as far as possible away from the temperature at which it is rejected from the engine. Namely, when the steam is vented from the cylinder in a steam engine. Obviously the methodology would depend on the type of heat engine, but for a steam engine that's, that's what we're discussing. So naturally, engineers that have worked on steam engines and want to increase their efficiency are looking to raise the acceptance temperature or lower the rejection temperature. Or both. You could do both. Though, often they focused on one or the other because doing just one of these things was already a taxing issue. Because while I say it and it sounds easy enough, it ain't. In terms of lowering the rejection temperature, well, any techniques to do that often wound up with developmental dead ends. Simply because you could really only do it in two different ways. Either increase the size of the cylinders, which, look, there's only so big you can make them, so obviously that never stretched very far, or you could condense the exhaust. The problem with that, though, is that adding condensers to a steam engine has historically been a not a good idea. In practice, it often led to ridiculously high maintenance costs, and it wasn't very efficient, and there were complications, and it just, it was just one of those things that never really worked all that great in most contexts. However, raising the acceptance temperature is actually pretty easy in the tactical sense, because all you have to do is raise the steam at a higher pressure and a temperature. That's it. That's all you have to do. So, great, let's just do that. Well, okay, yeah, it's easy to say, and technically easy to do, but again, in practice, it was like, oh, wait, no, this is, this is actually very annoying, because there's all sorts of considerations you have to make the second you do it. Any kind of high-pressure design was more complicated from the get-go, because you couldn't just build a normal steam locomotive and over-pressurize it, because that would make it explode. 
you needed to specially build these things, and you could pretty much never use a fire tube boiler in them because of the structural strength requirements. The modifications required to make a fire tube boiler withstand the pressures involved meant that their shells became so thick that they were just too friggin' heavy. You could never make it work practically, so they had to use water tube boilers instead. That's fine, but water tube boilers come with their own list of issues, particularly involving scale deposits and the corrosion associated with that. Scale deposits in steam locomotives it wasn't a new issue, nor an unknown one, and they're generally pretty hard to see, nearly impossible most of the time. They also often have a habit of showing up in places that weren't readily accessible. You had to deconstruct the entire machine to get at them, and they could be very dangerous, leading to overheating and possible, you know, the explosions. That's gonna be a common theme in this video, just to be clear. And those types of explosions being risks are another reason why people were a little hesitant to even try the high pressure thing at all, because it's already dangerous enough when a regular steam engine suffers that kind of cataclysmic failure, like a crown sheet failure, because they explode. A high pressure steam locomotive, if that were to happen, would be far and away worse. And as a result, the high pressure idea was something experimented with, but never something that really took off because of the safety risks involved and the fact that they were never efficient in the mechanical sense. Overall, pretty much any high pressure design was always a maintenance nightmare. And even if it worked, the costs associated with upkeep overshadowed the savings made on fuel, for example. Yes, if they did function, they were more efficient in that category than a regular steam locomotive would be. But when you're spending even more on maintenance, it doesn't matter. Plus, regular conventional steam locomotives would eventually start being equipped with superheaters. And superheaters wound up making a regular steam locomotive much more efficient without the mechanical complexity. And as I mentioned, there were many different kinds of high pressure steam locomotive, but I'm gonna focus on the big one, the major one, the one that a lot of people already know about, but I do kinda wanna talk about it again, cause I have talked about it before, because it did appear on my worst trains ever list. The LMS 6399 Fury. First of all, that's a great name. Absolutely, 100%, no question about it. Awesome, awesome, awesome. She was constructed by the North British Locomotive Company in 1929 as a potential candidate for the future of steam technology. A lot of different companies were experimenting with such ideas around this time. Over at the London and Northeastern, they'd been messing about with the W1, which was also a high pressure steam locomotive, but she was only using 450 PSI. Not that excessive in terms of high pressure. I mean, she was, but not tremendously so. Fury, on the other hand, was, well, just a little, little outrageous, uh, frankly. To begin with, she wasn't actually a straight up high pressure steam locomotive. She was technically an ultra high pressure, oh good, semi compound steam locomotive. And she utilized a Schmidt based boiler system. The Schmidt system was actually a potential solution for the scale problem I mentioned before. See, one way to avoid scale in this context is to use distilled water. That's great and all, but that means you have to have a ready supply of distilled water all the time, and that's not practical. Like, no, like, this stuff is kept in water towers. They, they get water out of the lake. Like, no, that's not gonna work. The Schmidt system, however, Okay, so the way it worked is that it used a sealed, ultra-high-pressure circuit that transferred heat to a regular high-pressure circuit. Not ultra, just high-pressure circuit with heating coils inside of a high-pressure boiler. There would also be a low-pressure boiler operating in a much more conventional way, being fed from the high pressure. So it's kind of this, this, this slow downgrade thing, but it starts with the ultra, but the ultra system is sealed. So you get the distilled water and you can see how this is supposed to work. And yeah, it was a tactical solution that did, to be fair, work, but how well did it work? And the answer was, yeah. To begin with, what the heck is ultra high pressure? Why are we doing that? Well, see, the, uh, th that circuit, 
the Ultra Circuit, uh, worked at about, oh, you know, between 1,400 and 1,800 PSI. What? Yo, that's... We don't need... What? Why? That's horrifying! <laughs> Wait a minute! Good God! But indeed, that, that's how it worked. It was closed, filled with distilled water, and it would transfer heat to the high-pressure steam, which worked at 900 PSI. Ugh! Which helped provide power to the cylinders, as well as helping to recirculate the distilled water. The third system, again, was conventional, and operated at 250 PSI, heated purely by the combustion gases from the coal fire. This sounds really complicated. Because it was. And that was a big part of her problem. This is ridiculous. But she was built and utilized, for a short time anyway, for testing, in the year of our Lord, 1930. That's when she managed to kill somebody. Yeah, uh, as far as I know, uh, despite the inherent danger of high-pressure steam locomotives, this is the only one that I'm familiar with that did manage to definitively murder a man. Uh, and it happened on one of her longer test runs. While she was approaching Castares at a slow rate of speed, one of her ultra-high-pressure tubes burst! And then ejected the coal fire through the fire hole door, which managed to kill Louis Schofield, who worked for the superheater company. It was suspected the reason for the failure was overheating, but due to lack of steam flow through the tube, Despite taking a human being's life in cold blood, they didn't give up on Fury, though development was significantly delayed because it was the Great Depression. They did manage to eventually fix her, and she did conduct some more trials in early 1934. An analysis showed there were... well, not technical problems. The repairs did function, and she functioned. But again, operating costs were just too high. Yes, she was much more efficient in the tactical sense when it came to fuel. But maintenance on her was a complete nightmare in order to keep her working. She never generated a profit for LMS at any point, because how could she? You had to pay someone to fix her, more than one person to fix her, and it took a lot of time to fix her. Yeah, she didn't use as much coal, but what's the point if she's going to spend more than the money you save on fuel costs while sitting in the maintenance shed? It just didn't make any sense. So ultimately, she was a complete economic failure. But that wasn't quite the end of her story. See, this was a perfectly good frame. I mean, technically. You know, in a cab, in a, in a tender. I mean, there's, there's plenty of parts here that are still conventional. So LMS took one look at her and was like, We can rebuild her! We have the technology! And by LMS, I mean William Stanier. He, he, he took care of that. She was rebuilt at Crewe, in 1935, and given a conventional taper boiler with a brand new smoke box as well as inside cylinders. She was renamed to British Legion, and was still technically a prototype, but for a whole class of locomotives that would be constructed, the rebuilt Royal Scott class. However, Fury, now British Legion, renumbered to 6170, was still unique. See, as part of her rebuild, she was given a Type 2 boiler, whereas all the other rebuilt Royal Scots were given Type 2 A's. Those spoilers, despite both being two, aren't actually interchangeable, uh, at least not without heavy modifications. They, they aren't the same thing, meaning that British Legion was still a little bit unique, but much more successful in this form than she had been as the Fury. She also didn't manage to kill anybody in this form, as far as I know. It wasn't just the boiler that made her different, either. She also had a fancier cab with side windows, and she was the only one with a single chimney, at, at least at first. She would be modified later with a double chimney and smoke deflectors. And after British Rail took over, she'd be renumbered to 46170. And lasted until 1962, but sadly, despite her history as a two-time experimental locomotive, she was scrapped. Rendering her unique characteristics completely extinct, though two of her little sisters did manage to survive. 6100, formerly 6152, and 6115. But we got way off topic, didn't we? I guess this locomotive's weird. But in terms of the high pressure thing, yeah, it's not a... It just wasn't something that really worked that well. It, just the maintenance involved was too much. 
Perhaps with further development, they could have found a way to simplify things to make maintenance easier. But then you have the concerns over the high pressure. I mean, look, we get the efficiency here, but like one pinhole leak in a high pressure system and you're talking a nuclear bomb going off on the main line. Like, I, and nobody got time for that. Till next time, this is Darkness and a bitch wall of fun. Farewell.